right, all right, all right. I'm here again, long overdue, with Jake Orthwine. Orthwine, Orthwine, I mean. I've never said that wrong, man. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good, man. Good to see you. Likewise. So, um, yes, we have a lot of juicy stuff to dive into today. And I thought uh, we would jump jump straight in here. And so uh, it's going to be maybe a little more loosely related to Chapman this this time. We're going to discuss it from the lens of Chapman's stuff as well. But it's going to be... Um, Maybe some imp- improvising around those ideas, things adjacent to what he said on topics of uh, spirituality broadly, I guess, uh, non-duality and self and Dzogchen and different emphasis there. And maybe if we have time, we'll get to one of my current uh, beefs that I have with my intellectual hero, Sam Harris. So that could be fun as well. Um, are you ready? Yeah, all of that sounds fun. That sounds perfect. All right. So the first thing uh, stems from a discussion that we've had privately quite a while back. And I remember because of the time differences, it's always the case that either I get a hold of you or the other way around, like really early uh, in the morning or late in the evening. So it's always like very inconvenient for us. And so I remember you finally calling me back when I was like trying to get to the gym. And I really want, I was rushed on time because I needed to work out before for work. And I really wanted to talk to you at the same time. So I was like standing <laughs> on my way down to the basement to the gym where I know there would be no reception. Just like <laughs> talking to you, trying to hash out these nuances here. Um <laughs> And uh, it was on the t- discussing non-duality in the gym stairwell. That's <laughs> yeah, that's the the right place to do it, right? Why not? Yeah. And so I remember uh, distinctly asking you about Zogchen and the difference in emphasis between how Sam Harris talks about it and how Chapman talks about it. And I was very confused because, and all in relation to the self. And what that means. And so, um, essentially, the way I understand it, uh, Sam Harris, he speaks about the essential um, or the main insight of meditation in general, but he's he's saying Dzogchen got this right, is the no-self nature of consciousness. The fact that if you look closely enough at your experience, the sense of being a self... Um, will not be there. And he draws an analogy with the optic blind spot often. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if you look closely enough, you'll see this. And that's the way he speaks about Dzogchen. And Chapman, on the other hand, seems to have a bone to pick with the no-self lingo in general. And I know in his article called Selfless? Selfness? I think, on meaningness, where he writes mm-hmm. about um, what he calls intermittently continuing instead, which we'll get to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's, he's, also, he's also sort of very decidedly says, you know, the self is not a spiritual obstacle on, on, on divinity. So, you know, he, he's, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah, on many fronts. And I, I remember him starting that article uh, saying something like, um, he's lining out all the, according to him, mistaken views on self, and he mm-hmm. ends with, and the word most mistaken or most ludicrous of all is the idea that there's no self. Um, right. <laughs> the, the Buddhist view that there's no self. And worst of all, some pop science writers agree or something. I don't think, yeah. I've always thought he r- was referring to Harris, but I think that he wasn't aware of Harris's view, according to a Twitter exchange I had with Chapman recently. So I think he yeah. didn't. But uh, it's all a projection, right? experience but um so that's very interesting to me and i i think i have a slightly better grasp of uh how they might be talking past each other there but i would like you to explain to me here um if these two views are reconcilable why they're putting a different emphasis on it and where you stand on all of this okay okay uh tall tall order um (laughs) yeah okay so so just just uh in case people don't know what the backdrop is here okay so so both sam harrison and david chapman who whom we've been talking about uh uh 
are very fond of uh, the Dzogchen tra- tradition in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and uh, Dzogchen is one of these, what are called like essence traditions in Buddhism, where uh, uh, you sort of practice the mind of enlightenment as the whole practice. And you can't really begin practicing Dzogchen until you've had an introduction, usually through through a teacher, to the nature of mind, uh, what gets called Rigpa and Dzogchen, which is just sort of uh, mm-hmm. the, the qualities of enlightenment are already there in your mind always, all the time. You can have them pointed out to you through, from, a, from a teacher if your mind is sufficiently like well prepared and then uh the practice thereafter is just to continue to recognize the nature of mind and how mind is all the time uh to stabilize mm. that recognition right so um, sounds nice yes yeah indeed um but uh so yeah so so uh Bo, uh Cha- chapman you know in his writing about Dzogchen doesn't place a ton of emphasis on on rigpa he's sort of uh, he's writing uh, around the practice experience, but but uh, much more about the sort of philosophical components of it. Um, but it, you know, uh, you know, is is obviously aware and uh, has experienced the the practice side of it too. But um, yeah, so Sam Harris summarizes the the insight of Rigpa as insight into the illusion of the self. I mean, so 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 uh, mm-hmm. often the pointing out instructions that one will get, uh, you know, involve looking for what's looking or or some other sort of gesture of attention that in the first instant will sort of reveal to you uh if it works that there isn't a center to consciousness that there's not a sort of subject riding around behind your eyes in the head and you right. look for it you know the looking is is again it's much more of a gesture than it is a literal looking because you can't you can't look it's it's it's, it's just to provoke a certain gesture of attention and then you see it's not there and then you rest and you rest as the condition where that subject no longer feels like it's sitting behind your eyes uh, or that it's obvious that, that that wasn't ever the center of consciousness. And so, yeah, so Sam Sam will summarize the insight as, as insight into the illusoriness of the self with self-understood to mean a very specific thing there, which is this moment-to-moment yeah. perceptual sense of there being a subject behind your eyes, thinker of thoughts, experiencer of experience, mm-hmm. willer of willed actions, because he certainly like would tie this to um to to the illusion of the subjective illusion of free will there are other ways of talking about free will but so yeah that's the sense of self that that he considers illusory and um uh that that differs from the way that one might approach uh the insight into no self from a you know a um theravada or or sutric perspective in buddhism where you're uh you know, dualistically, so so from the standpoint of feeling like a subject, paying attention to moment to moment sensations, um, uh, instructed to like you're, you, what you want to have insight into is what are called the three characteristics: so impermanence, uh, unsatisfactoriness, or, or suffering, and and not self. And but but uh, at least on Harris's construal, the impermanence door is really what's getting emphasized there. So you notice how rapidly experience is changing, and then. Uh, out of a kind of inference, you assume none of it could be me, and then uh, you, that you mean, precipitates. This is happening in Theravada. You mean? Yeah, oh. th- this, this is this yeah. is the ther- uh, Theravada like way of approaching insight into not self, and the Dzogchen right, insight is right, is very different, right. where nothing has to be changing, nothing nothing has to ch- nothing has to change at all about your experience. The, the claim is that this is the nature of mind all the time, and. Yeah you're overlooking it but but it's there it's still there now even if you feel like you're totally bound up in delusion it's just the nature of consciousness but the claim from the theravadan side the sutric side is still a phenomenological one like there's no self in in the same way that there's no self from the Dzogchen view or is it a stronger claim about yeah a, a person not even existing in some sense um well, okay, so so the emphasis on it's just a phenomenological claim is kind of like a uh, modern way of talking about it, you know. So, like in in its in its origins, it's bound mm. up with this whole, you know, we talked about this, like the soteriological project of of escaping samsara and not being reborn and all this stuff, right? So, like, um, I, I think there are phenomenological interpretations of all those things, but I, I don't know exactly like how much 
that would have been emphasized in a, in its earliest presentation or something like that. But yes, right. as you'd get yeah. it taught it now, yeah, these these are phenomenological claims as to whether the uh, not not self that you're being told to uh, notice in in a, a Theravada context is the same as the Dzogchen one. I mean, in a certain sense, I think it is, but it's difficult to to unpack exactly how. Um, yeah, right. So so yeah, we we we, we can get into that. We can table um, that. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, I think I think we will get into it in the sense that like part of what Chapman yes. is reacting to when he says yes. yourself is not a spiritual obstacle is the sort of Theravada sense that there's something that you need to overcome or get out of or defective about this world and and worldly existence that is very much the sort of ethos of, of Theravada. So I, mm. maybe, maybe, maybe it would be helpful to sort of orient people with respect to these these different views that that. Um, because this is something that that Chapman emphasizes a lot, that that Harris doesn't emphasize at all, um, at least from a from a philosophical point of view. He does from a, from a practice point of view. But um, mm-hmm. so f- from the point of view of Dzogchen, uh, you will often hear sort of Buddhist approaches summarized as falling into one of three buckets of either Sutra, Tantra, or Dzogchen. Uh, the characteristic uh, view and method of 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 sutra on this understanding uh and this encompasses uh generally like theravada buddhism so the earliest types of buddhism um mm. are, are summarized uh in terms of renunciation so the idea is that uh you know you've got samsara and nirvana you've got the sort of cyclical round of 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 uh existence and 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 you've got nirvana as this you know getting off the getting off the the cycle uh not being reborn and right renunciation is the path by which you would accomplish that so 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 you know <laughs> nice att- attachments what sort of fetters you to the world are the thing to be renounced uh such that you'll no longer be bound to this conditioned worldly existence right yeah and that's 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 the framing giving in sutra given in sutra now from the sort of zogchen view where these there's the sutra tantra zogchen that's not ultimate metaphysical truth at all it's a view with certain uses in a practice context. So it's like, it's like, uh, it is helpful to adopt that view to take up certain practices in a relative sense, but it's not ultimately true from the Zochen view that, that you actually are, are, you know, that attachments are actually a problem or something like that, you know? Um, and certainly it can become a problem to say, to, to, to devalue this world and, th- and come to view there as being something defective about it if you take the sutric view too seriously. Does that, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, right. So it's pragmatically true, as it were. Uh, within, within, a, within, like a, yeah, within a scope of a certain practice context, it's a helpful view. I mean, there's this whole idea of like view and, and views in Buddhism where it's like you, you can instrumentally take up a view, but they're not meant to be ultimately true. They're meant to be a view from which you can practice in a relative sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, the language of like attachment, you know, and, and the goal of non-attachment is a very sutric way of talking about things. Um, with this sort of like value judgment of like what you want to do is renounce the world and being attached to the world is a problem from a tantric Mm -hmm. view. Uh, uh, renunciation is not the, the goal uh transformation is the goal and attachment is not a problem you're in, you're supposed to be in and of the world and then and then from a zogchen view uh it's it changes how this will get talked about sometimes it's like self liberation or something like that but the point is there's nothing to be transformed either <laughs> the mind is always <laughs> already perfect and in the in the, in this condition and you can see how okay that would be like the ultimate view but you could get told that and it would be absolutely useless from a practice. I was standpoint. just like, going to say, it, it kind of yeah. sounds like the, the worst ever advice to someone who's like uh, insecure around the opposite sex. And they want to pick someone up and ask someone who's successful. Like, what do I do? Like, Oh, just be yourself, which yeah, is yeah. true <laughs> actually, but <laughs> it's the worst thing to hear if you have no idea how to do that. Yeah, yeah no, I, cool. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, 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 if 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 you came to you know your your meditation teacher and you're like how do I get enlightened and they're like good news you're already enlightened, uh, <laughs> Fuck in you, some dude. sense that is that is in fact true but but it's not uh, it's useless right and so there's a, there's a sort of uh, progression where if they gave you sutric instructions and a sutric view that would mm-hmm. at least be 
like a, a path you could begin from where you where you are. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Even yeah. if it would be a path that you would like like a, a view and a path that you would have to eventually renounce. Um or, or like like yeah. like of like, like yeah um and uh I don't know I don't know how much you want to get into sort of esoterica of practice but for example like uh Charlie Chapman's spouse who's who's now teaching in this uh this meditation community they teach uh what are called these these four knowledge ors which is like a, a presentation of a sort of uh path to Dzogchen and the first of the four are is a uh, shine which is uh like a tibetan translation of of the word that ordinarily means like concentration or, or tranquility so uh, shamatha but um the only practice instruction there is remain uninvolved basically like sort of open awareness and remain un remain uninvolved mm. and the point is to encompass in that one instruction basically the path of sutra <laughs> right so like uh where you arrive at from doing that remain uninvolved meditation is is insight into emptiness which is the the goal of of sutra but it's the base for practicing tantra um, is there a way there to just quickly explain what emptiness means here in this in this usage <laughs> um, i'm yeah, always uh, i always confuse that with impermanence in terms of the phenomenology well, it's not, yeah, it's not, it's not it's not an accident that that you would confuse them because they are in a sutra presentation they are sort of related. Okay, so so here's my uh, yeah I should probably put this disclaimer over the whole conversation that this is my idiosyncratic way of having tried to make sense of all these different things that I the you know, and people I think are interesting. Yeah. So like in no sense is this canonical from like a Buddhist point of view. But I'll, I'll summarize this how, is I, what how we I tend want. to think of it. This is what the people okay. want. Yeah. So, um, from a from a sutric point of view using this language of like grasping the way to think about what emptiness is is okay so habitually we're in this condition of grasping at what's pleasant and averting what's unpleasant and experience seems to have this character of solidity such that you could even grasp to it and hold on to it but that project is always sort of failing and emptiness is this sort of recognition that uh experience is is insubstantial in such a way as to make grasping it impossible and grasping is this is this sort of phenomenological gesture. It's not like a like understanding exactly. It's like this this thing you do of clinging to experience. Again, this is very like sutric language, uh, you know, clinging. Um, but uh, uh, so emptiness well, you can think of that... from this point of view as being ungraspability. It's like this holographic, uh, insubstantial, uh, yeah, e empty in a certain sense quality that makes it so that the the idea that you could grasp the reason why it's liberative. To, to recognize this as opposed to terrible mm -hmm. is that you yeah. couldn't grasp it anyway. <laughs> and seeing yeah. that makes this sort of grasping project. It's uh -huh. like, it's like, you know, trying to cl cling, cling to air. You see, like right, you sort of see right, the futility right, right. of it, you know? No, that's, I've never heard that framing before, but, but so, so let's drill down a little more. What does that mean in terms of a specific phenomenological experience? Like I'm sitting in my room right now. Um, yep. And I'm looking out and perception is giving me, for instance, I see a candle over there as an object. Um, mm -hmm. what, what would, yeah, can you use that as an example of grasping? What would grasping it mean? Yeah, okay. So, so uh, by default, the way you probably feel with respect to that candle, especially if you like focus on it, is mm -hmm. I'm a subject over here. That's an object over there. And that that sense of being a subject is sort of produced also in the reification of that candle as an object where like the two, those two things go together. Like the harder you focus on it, the more you feel like a self over here and it feels like an object over there. And there's a kind of solidity to both and like a separateness to the candle as an object. And if you tell me, tell me if that roughly matches onto your experience, this is a, this is a loose description. It's not like a, you know, that sort of get you like, the sense of being a subject over here and that there being objects over there, that makes sense to you, right? Right. And that they're fully separate is the key, right? Because Yeah, yeah. The, it's it's over there, you're over here, and it's an object. It's its own thing. Um, mm -hmm. And, okay, so if, if you relax that a little bit, just like sort of don't try to fixate on the candle at all and, and, and pay less, you know, intense attention to it. Yep. There's a sense in which that sort of subject side on your side gets relaxed a little bit, and the sense of the separateness of the candle from everything around it can get relaxed a little bit too. You know, like 
you still yep. see it it's, a, it's still a candle but you know you're not it's you're not paying the kind of attention you would pay to it if you were about to go pick it up or if you're about mm-hmm. to try to shoot it with an arrow you know this intense fixated attention right yep okay so uh proceeding along that same dimension of, of just sort of relaxing this sense of fixation uh you can see that experience has this kind of experience in general and the, the candle included, but now you're no longer sort of fixating the candle as a candle um, has this kind of holographic character where you can come to see it as just uh, like the, the way Harris will describe this just to, to get people looking in the right direction is like, this is all being produced by your mind right now. This is all consciousness. And that's not, that's not a, you know, uh, the only buddhist way of saying it but but it is one way of saying it, which like this is all a kind of projection um mm-hmm. and again the instruction is not to think about that it's to notice it having this kind of tr- weirdly translucent character it appears exactly the same way but somehow when you're not paying that kind of fixated attention it it has a slightly more holographic character you know where it's almost like if you did reach out and try to touch your computer you know, you could reach right through it. That won't that won't happen. But <laughs> right, you see, you see, right, you see what I mean. Because, but that would have to be. Um, it's a similar thing for every sense channel, basically. Yeah, exactly. Right? It, you it, can it, go this, this is yeah. just. It, I'm using vision because it's most vivid there. But but it's just as yeah. true of the sensations in your chest or whatever else. You know. Right, and I, I would like to add actually to that my favorite uh, cognitive sciency way of uh, getting at this experientially is if you close one eye and then you push the other eye, the open eye with your finger so that the uh, image on your retina starts jumping around and then you cl- clearly you can see that it's a, not a three-dimensional thing and you can see that it it's, yeah, literally a hologram jumping around in there. Oh, interesting, yeah. It's very trippy. Yeah. Okay, but then I understand, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so uh, a certain trap opens up here where one might be inclined to sort of philosophically conclude from that kind of experience that, okay, everything is illusory, right? Like, yeah. like there's nothing there. There's no world out there. Like, yep. there's just this sort of hologram. That's not what's being claimed. That's not what Harris would, would claim. That's not what Chapman would claim. But mm-hmm. o- often you will hear in a sort of uh, practice instruction, you know, regard the world as illusion or something like that. And that's much less, like... It, uh, it's not very helpful to interpret that in a sort of philosophical justification uh, uh, yeah in a, in a sort of justifiably uh, as a justifiable philosophical view so much as it is trying to provoke a way of relating to experience that doesn't fixate and reify it so that you can sort of get toward this experience of emptiness does that make yes. sense Yes, it does. And to make uh, to be fair with, to Sam Harris, he often uh, makes this point explicit that he's only yeah, talking yeah. about a matter of experience. But can yeah. you actually drop the Shinsen Young quote that um, you shared with me on this very topic that I thought was just a very good yeah, yeah. reminder of this? And well, and this uh, this this will also help sort of like uh, orient people toward uh, why this isn't necessarily like a re- renunciative view either. Um, even mm-hmm. though there's a renunciative way of talking about it. Okay, so so uh, Shinzen has this line that a student of his, who I said a retreat with, quoted, um, where he says, the only thing we are ever called to let... Basically, a student had asked, um, you know, I have all these projects in my life that I don't want to let go of, right? Like, like you know, yeah. you get this instruction often in spiritual circles to let go, and they're like, but I don't want to let go of my, you know, my marriage or my children, whatever, whatever, you know, like all these things that like letting go doesn't seem like the right move. And... He said, you know, the only thing we are ever called to let go of is our present moment sensory experience, which, which, uh, that's so good. Yeah. It, it, it's a very, very helpful line and it gets at what this word, like some, in some places you will see this idea of letting go extended to the whole of one's life and one's connections to the world, especially in, in yeah. a Theravada context. And that's not necessary, uh, that's like a means of getting at a certain experiential insight that can be gotten with a certain gesture of attention toward sensory experience, not necessarily like I'm going to pack up and abandon all my projects in life. Now, <laughs> yeah. like that can be helpful too, right? Like it's helpful to go on retreat and like literally let go of like one's worldly existence a little bit mm-hmm. to make it easier to pay the kind of attention that, that, <laughs> that precipitates this insight. But, but 
uh, you're not actually being asked to let go of the world in yep. in a yeah in a sort of con- conceptual sense in order to uh, to have this insight the, the letting go of sensory experience and you can see how that would tie to this impermanence thing right where again what you're yeah. trying to n- you can have this sort of reflective view of impermanence of like oh we're going to die or whatever like but but the the insight producing kind of experience of impermanence is is a moment to moment sensory experience kind where you you're yeah. seeing that things are changing in such a way as to make it impossible to grasp them and so letting go is yeah it's that gesture of non non grasping that would be the sutric frame so you were talking about the um the four different steps there in terms of dzogchen practice that they were teaching and you you were on the second one i think so dzogchen again for it to be really dzogchen you're just talking about rigpa in some sense which is the, the sort of nature of mind and there's no there's no path really <laughs> like it's just like uh you know mm-hmm. uh, the path is the goal as they say right so so uh but this this presentation is meant to sort of encompass the paths of sutra and tantra to arrive at w- with a mind toward arriving at Sokchen and sort of from the view of Sokchen. So the first of the right. four is 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 the Shine practice. The instruction is remain uninvolved, and the the goal is to arrive at the, the, this insight into emptiness. And you can see now how you know I just did that sort of brief explanation of okay, like what's going on with emptiness. Uh, the Shine instruction is just remain uninvolved. So every time you notice your attention fixating on something, release it and remain uninvolved. And that do- you're not trying to go into a stupor, but you are constantly relaxing that sense of fixation um, that that attention continually falls into. And if you keep doing that, eventually thoughts won't show up quite as much. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can sort of get a sense of the space in between thoughts, and then you can see emptiness um and uh it it uh, in at least in the traditional presentation like it's it's it said that it, you know you you really want to arrive at the state of no thought so it's like it's called napa or something um where that would be super super vivid but there's nothing in principle that makes it necessary that thoughts not arise it's just that when right. thoughts arise we we so habitually fixate on them that it can be very difficult to have a vivid experience of emptiness in the midst of thought. It's not impossible. Yeah. That's the whole point of, of the sort of Sokshan view in some sense is that like, like nothing has to change about experience for this to be true, but it can be very hard to see when you're habitually fixating. And, and uh, a very useful instruction, I think, is um, as soon as you notice an intention to control attention – Drop the intention or put that. Yeah, that, the that's that's the that's the Shinzen Young do nothing do meditation nothing. instruction, which is I, I agree. Yeah, it, it it is very similar. I, I would say uh, it's a slightly different emphasis, but it, I basically if I were if I were to get those two practice instructions, I practice them the same way. So they're basically the same. Likewise, right. M- Michael Taff will teach this as like dropping the ball. You know, so like you can sort of <laughs> feel like like almost like a dog. You know, who won't let go of the ball. That's how you relate to experience all the time. And you're like, you just over and over again, drop the ball, drop the ball. Mm. Uh, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how helpful it would be necessarily to go through the four knowledge doors, although we could also do that. Uh, but maybe maybe to circle back to this Sam Harris version of self thing. Yeah, yeah. you tell me, you tell me. I mean, just uh, give us in words what two and three are without explaining how to do them, perhaps, and then just... Oh, okay oh yeah uh, uh so so um I, I, uh, the second one is la tong um where okay so from that condition of emptiness you're now letting thoughts emerge like sort of fish from the water you see things spring out of emptiness so you're letting form re-emerge out of emptiness basically and then um i the the other two I, I, I can't remember one, one is called Niemed, but I can't I can't remember. And then the fourth one is basically like Rigpa. You're already there, right? Like like. But the the idea basically is that you get to emptiness, you see form emerge out of emptiness, and then you sort of alternate, and then you can see their sort of inseparability of form and emptiness, and then you're already in Rigpa if that's true. Um, right, right. And that's that's the sort of uh, trajectory. Um, and then and then you know from the Rigpa point of view, all four of those steps were kind of unnecessary and there weren't ever really any steps you know yeah 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 um, and that's what i yeah. like with sam's approach i mean he does include a beginner's course but he's quite i i like that he's going straight to the the heart of the matter there with his type of pointing out instruction i like that yeah well certainly like like i i, f- I find it helpful even though i can't 
just generally practice Dzogchen, you know, uh, going straight to, and, and, you know, I think Chapman would say this too. Like, I, I don't have the kind of ready access to real Rigpa that allows me to practice Dzogchen. But, but practicing with the view of Dzogchen is extremely helpful to me because, because it keeps you from getting caught up in this mistaken sort of, um, yes, yeah, sutric view of renunciation or something like that. Like, like you, there's a way, and this Harris harps on this endlessly, that the sort of dualistic framing of practice that one would get in, in Vipassana, which is a sort of Theravada uh, practice, is uh, can cause one to persistently overlook the very insight that you're seeking because it, re- it, it, it reinforces yeah. a sense yeah. of, of, of dualistic fixation and the sense of having a goal and somewhere to get to and all, all of this. So, um, yeah, let's see where... Okay, so that that's the that's the sort of four knowledge drawers, and they're, they're meant to encompass uh, in the first one the the whole path of sutra, right? So insight into emptiness, and then and then the path of tantra, and then and then Dzogchen, kind of in their in their frame. So um, so you know renunciation to uh, to uh, it's like it's like emptiness, uh, vivid vivid form, and then and then the non duality of emptiness and form. Um, which is sort of like Sutra Tantra Dzogchen in some sense. Um, okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, where should okay? So let 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 me let me let me step back a little bit and just sort of reorient people because that that was pretty like Buddhist esoterica. Uh, <laughs> uh, so when Sam says the self is an illusion, what kind of self? We we talked about what kind of self he means, which is this moment to moment perceptual sense of being a subject behind your face. Um, the, the Chapman emphasis, uh, is not on that sense of self, but the way he'll, the, the sort of, um, Dzogchen framing that he will endorse is this non-duality of emptiness and form thing. Uh, and, uh, this also will get described as the, uh, non-duality of, uh, luminosity and, uh, and I think it's emptiness. Let me look at like what the... There, there are different ways that this gets put. Um, I'm just resting in rig pa while you do that. Good, good. Yeah, as, uh, as you should be. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. So it, 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 it is, it is em- em- emptiness and luminosity is, is one way of putting it. So, okay, luminosity in its ocean context is this sort of self-knowing quality of mind. So, like, mind is spontaneously, instantaneously aware sort of in every point in space basically it's this quality of like instantaneously knowing uh that quality of mind and then this quality of emptiness and that those two qualities are inseparable that's that's like another way of of describing rigpa when you see those two things as separate and the reason why that's like interesting or insightful is that typically you can't see typically you're not seeing both of those things at once where it feels from from the standpoint of like dualistic fixation, it feels like to know anything is to kind of have this kind of grasping on it, right? Where like knowing seems to have this dualistic character of I'm over here and it's over there and I have to do something to know it. Like if I told you to pay attention to your breath, like you have to do something to do that, right? Like mm-hmm. notice your breath, right? Now, awareness is just spontaneously knowing the sensations associated with the breath and there's literally nothing you could do to add to that <laughs> you know like it's it's all extra effort in some sense to to do something there or like sounds right now so sounds are sort of the easiest way to recognize this sounds are just happening and you can't grab them you can't do anything to change them they're just spontaneously being known as they arise and there's nothing you could do to 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 stop them there's nothing you could do to hold on to them you know, you, you you see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's this spontaneous uh, luminosity, this the spontaneous knowing quality that awareness has, and then emptiness is this this other quality, which is it's uh, even though it's spontaneously known, it doesn't have any substance. So it's like it's almost like it's not there, like it <laughs> it, it it's it's total it's utterly insubstantial, it's utterly like holographic, it's utterly yeah like basically not there in this in the sense that you tend to think things are there but I mean, it's spontaneously it known so it's not it's not a nihilistic view either like like it's kind of there right. and kind of not it has there. no <laughs> essence i mean there's nothing there to fixate to right it's 
There is yes, phenomena, yeah. there is stuff, but it's just, yeah, it's not something fixed and essential, right? Yeah, yeah. There's there, uh, no no essence is a sort of good way of putting it. Um, and this this relates to how you know Chapman uses a kind of Dzogchen view to 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 talk about you know other things like you know in in meaning this about concepts and categories and things like that and and a sort of anti essentialist view. But but yeah, experientially, right? Yes, there's nothing there that you could grasp to that's solid or substantial from an experiential point of view. It's just all empty. And but but the reason why that's not nihilistic is that doesn't mean that there's nothing there. That that's the weird again. This sounds paradoxical conceptually. Experientially, it's not at all. And that's 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 where this stuff gets really tricky. Is is you try to work it out conceptually, like it's not there, but it is there. Like that doesn't make any sense. Uh, experientially, there just you sort of have to either take my word for it or like try to recognize. There's no sense in which those two things are in contradiction from an experiential point of view. So things are there in a certain sense and not there in another in that they they don't have any substantial existence. And yet they're spontaneously known in all their vivid display, <laughs> you know? Uh, right. I mean, yeah. I, I like the analogy of the um, watching a movie on a TV screen. Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially, it's all just light. Uh, reflected but then again you you and then there are no actual objects on the tv screen that you're seeing but you can clearly make out the difference between the people on the screen and the different objects and the scenery and um yeah yeah the the only i i i, I like that analogy too the only the only sort of uh uh potentially misleading thing about that analogy is that there's you and then there's the screen and yes. and that's not sure uh so this goes back to the sense of uh you know the importance of the not self thing okay so why why does sam say the the central thing about this insight is that there's no is the illusoriness of the self um that might not be obvious yet from from how we've been describing it but it goes back to what we were talking about when i was trying to sort of give you a sense of what emptiness is um the habitual condition that we find ourselves in is yeah, this this condition of of fixating or cling so so in in a in a sutric frame it would be called a clinging or grasping in a zogchen frame it would be much more like fixation and I tend to use those interchangeably but obviously they have different philosophical con connotations, um, um. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's this thing of fix fixating on moment to moment experience to sort of substantiate our sense of our own existence. So like, in order to know that I am there all the time, I have to sort of kind of tense around experience uh <laughs> right <laughs> right and and use experience as a sort of reference point for my own being moment to moment perceptually and uh but but by both reifying yourself as the contraction behind the face and and then also reifying all objects as not you yeah you yeah and, and 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 if you think you know if you're listening to this and you don't and you think like I'm not doing that? What the hell are you talking about? I'm not reifying. Like, it, this <laughs> yeah. is pointing to a certain experience, right? Which is that like you probably feel like you're behind your face, and not, you're not deliberately being like I need to reify my sense of myself behind my face. But yeah, in a yeah, certain yeah. sense, right, right. In a certain sense, the way we habitually fixate experience produces this sense of being a subject behind the face, and we use phenomena, we use moment to moment appearances to shore up that sense of being a, a separate and independent subject um like it's, it's a sort of like exaggerated fear of non-existence that sort of keeps this whole process in motion is that like if i didn't do this thing i wouldn't be there yeah or or, or yeah. I, it's it's not even that i wouldn't be there and this goes to why chapman says uh you know yourself is not a spiritual obstacle it's that you wouldn't yeah. have this second order like and i know that i'm there <laughs> you know like yeah i, I yeah, know exactly. that i know you know yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, that's also why it can be so frightening for people on yeah, psychedelics with ego dissolution or something where they think that they're actually dying because that uh, clinging or fixation is, is releasing. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and, and just to, just to spell out these different senses of, of the word self, that sense, that sense of like the way that we fixate experience in order to shore up a sense of a subject behind the head or inside the head is not the same thing as your personality, the patterns that you manifest that have a certain character, like ordered character to them, 
your your whole body, none of those things. Yeah. It's none of those things, right? And when Chapman says yourself is not a spiritual obstacle, he means you don't have to like obliterate the whole, you know, intermittently You don't have to actually that, die. Yeah, 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 yeah it, that 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 is your, you know, presentation in the world. You actually don't even have to obliterate that sense of being a subject behind the head because again, what's being claimed in his, in his Oakchen view is that uh, is that this is what experience is already like even when you feel contracted even when you feel like i'm here i am the ego behind my head awareness mm. isn't uh you know bound by that sense of being an ego behind the head so like if you think you have to get rid of that now now it can go it can go away but uh you don't have to get rid of it in order for mind to have these characteristics Mm. mind already yeah. has these kinds of characteristics now d typically what will happen is you you'll feel like an intense subject you might do one of these you know pointing out instructions like look for what's looking or something like that you'll in the sort of if it works in the sort of instant you'll see okay there's no like awareness is not bound by that and then the sense of uh contractedness will relax a little bit but it would be a mistake to assume the sense of contractedness has to relax in order for the state of mind I'm looking for to manifest because it's always already true. And you don't actually have to, it doesn't actually have to go away to recognize it. That's the, yeah. Mm, the energetics right. will dissipate often once you have clearly recognized, but but the energetics don't have to dissipate for it to be true. Does, does the sense of self behind your face have to be completely gone for the reduction of suffering benefit that sam harris um no claims is but, there but, to be there no no but but you have to uh recognize that in some sense that awareness is not bound by it so so yeah, this yeah. is where it's helpful to to not have the, the to, to have the not um to not have the, the harris framing of recognizing the illusoriness of the self yeah even though this is still what he means by it but forget forget about that language for a second and just go back to this non-duality of of uh luminosity and emptiness uh framing of it uh imagine the tension behind your face is still there like in exactly the sense that it's there right now but what you're what you're seeing so, what, what 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 is extremely vivid and clear is that everything is being spontaneously known as it arises without any ability to change or sort of like manipulate it and it's all utterly empty including that sense of contraction behind your face that's being simultaneously known mm. and it's utterly empty well then then there's no sense in which it's a problem <laughs> you know it's just yet yeah. more form it's yet more sensation yep. Yep. yeah so so yeah the the the, con the potential pitfall of this framing of uh the illusoriness of the self is that and and again you know harris harris does like he anticipates this and 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 if you if you listen to the full instructions, he doesn't make this mistake. But but one could make the mistake of of being like, okay, so I've got to get rid of that sense of contraction behind my face in order to recognize this. And it's like, no, uh, you don't have to get rid of anything. Uh, but it will sort of subside or relax a little bit once mm -hmm. you have the the insight. You know, yeah. I mean, or you can go one step. Or worse. if it gets a, or if it gets obliterated by psychedelics. You'll have the insight yeah. too, but 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 then, but then, but you might not. Uh, you might miss the fact that it's coincident with every moment of ordinary waking consciousness too. You think you have to obliterate your ego in order to yeah. recognize that yeah. awareness. What awareness is like, right? Yeah, no, for sure. And um, I was going to say that uh, the, the the worst version of misunderstanding what he's saying which I have done for a long time is to think that you as the person shouldn't exist. And there's something wrong with that. Yeah, and definitely that not can that. Lead, that can lead to, yeah, a lot of disassociation and, and very, uh, yeah, states you don't want to live in. And this is not redu reducing of suffering at all. But yeah. um, that, 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 that's, that's very much the, uh, like, the big pitfall of a sort of sutric frame where like, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, in some presentations, that's, that's deliberate where it's like yeah you really are like the body is a problem the world is a problem you're trying to get out of the world you're trying to shred experience 
until you just <laughs> eliminate all your connections to the world and all the sort of specific characteristics of your personality and whatever else. And then you're going to be free, right? Like you'll be in Nirvana, <laughs> which is just this like, you know, state free of characteristics and whatever. Now, like, uh, I, I think, I think that, that one can practice Theravada type practices without that being either the, the sort of understanding or the result of it. Uh, if yeah, if it if you take this sort of Shinzen frame of you know the only thing you're ever called to let go of is your present moment sensory experience, when you even when you're doing dualistic vipassana, the point is not to obliterate your connections to the world, it's mm -hmm. to see the insubstantiality in such a way as to no longer be fixating habitually. Basically, I mean that that's yeah, and emptiness can be I mean sorry, um, impermanence can be a doorway into that because okay everything is changing so fast you know, it's sort of futile for me to try to grab it. It it, it has the same character as that Dzogchen um, luminosity recognition, right? Which is that things are being spontaneously known moment to moment to moment. They arise of their own volition. They disappear of their own volition. And they're known spontaneously, like sort of, I'm, I'm using this word volition incorrectly, but you, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they're just known by themselves, yeah, by and, by and as awareness. And then they dissipate. Uh that recognition like impermanence is a sort of like a relative way of of approaching the same thing which is things are showing up and they're going away and there's nothing you could do to grasp them in between um mm. it's just that the difference is that that the zochen language is almost about the view rather than about what phenomena have to be like because from the zochen view you could be have having the most solid possible percept you know of like there's just a chunky blocky <laughs> like like obviously not impermanent you know uh thing in my experience and that yeah. can still be spontaneously known and so and so not like yeah not not clung to uh impermanence is pointing in the same direction but but uh it can give the misimpression that you need to you know build up a ton of mindfulness on retreat so it seems like everything's arriving arising and passing away really really quickly in order to get there which which you don't you know it's already true of what every experience is like right so if i if i can uh sum up uh your answer here to the question i asked about their two views there it seems like okay so so the the way sam harris is using self here um is in a different sense than chapman so harris is talking about yeah this phenomenological uh tension behind your face which i think you coined that uh, which I think is awesome. Um, no, no, I, def I, de I definitely didn't. Yeah. It's, it's, oh, you didn't. It's, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, oh, okay. like, I, I don't know if Sam ever exactly puts it that way, but he, he, yeah, he's very clear that the, this tension behind your face is not, not my language. It's, it's a very, uh, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, on this podcast, you get the credit. Okay. Okay. I'll and, take it. Uh, yeah. and, <laughs> and then, okay. And then, so Chapman is uh, calling that something else because he wants to avoid presumably the, no self renunciation trap of Theravada, and so he's yep. talking about self in a more uh, inclusive sense of yeah, metaphysically your body exists and your personality and and all these yeah, and, juicy and, things that we want, and 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 a kind of monist error too, which is yeah, you know, this idea that everything is one. Yes, that yes, that, that's, that's like like that is often the because this is at least my way of interpreting it because our habitual experience is so dualistic. When people have the overcorrect, uh, yeah, the Zogchen recognition, either they have in the context of a sort of psychedelic experience where everything is getting obliterated, so it seems like it's all one, or mm -hmm. or they just interpret it this way. Yeah, they think it's all one, and and the point is, uh, it's not all one in the sense that you know, uh, uh, you know, socks and sandwiches are suddenly the same thing. You know, <laughs> like <Yeah>. like. <laughs> Uh, that that's the wrong <laughs> metaphysical conclusion to be drawn from it. Uh, right. Yeah. A, bo a boundary can be empty without it being illusory or or useless or whatever else. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think that I, the monist dualist uh, stuff that Chapman uh, explicates in his in his stuff, I think, is really worth its own episode. Basically, I think it's mm -hmm. very interesting, and I kind of have, am um, yeah, I'm very against this whole. Um, well, in a strong convictions, loosely held kind of manner, I guess, but I, I, I think it's problematic with the whole new, new age monists. We're all one way of talking about things.
I agree. And, yeah, yeah, cool. Um, and I mean, of course you would. If we're all one and I say that, then you need to agree, <laughs> right? Because right? yeah. we're the same. Yeah, I can't help but share your opinions because we are the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, okay. So I have some adjacent things here that I want to go into then. So maybe to continue on the idea of self here, since we just spoke about that. Um, I used to, I pivot a lot in my views on things, which I presume is a good thing. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that I'm evolving and not devolving, but the the idea that yeah, even to define what you are and the necessity uh, to box in what you are in words, um, I'm interested in that because I've done it so, so uh, intensely for a long time and just realized recently that I went from the Deutsche and you are the creative mind and your body is just your environment, kind of a dissociative thing for me um to now feeling more and more the more enlightened i become as it were uh the more i become in touch with (laughs) the less i suffer the less the voice in the head uh nags me about stuff um and the more in touch and fluid i am with my emotions the more i feel like i'm a a chimp uh (laughs) to a large extent i don't mean that in a negative sense but i feel like i I become more and more embodied and more and more in touch with how i am my body as well and i i just think yeah i don't know i want to hear where you stand on the whole because there there is a tendency in meditation circles uh and especially when people it seems to be kind of a natural progression of sorts where people go from maybe being fairly materialistic and just if you know i have to look really good i have to be you know pretty shallow nothing wrong with those things but when you're suffering a lot because you feel like you have to live up to some ideal of how your body should look or whatever uh Mm. that can be a bad thing and then going from that to maybe having a a psychedelic experience a meditation experience and going all the way in the other direction where you're like oh my god i had this experience on psychedelics where where i I, yeah it was just pure consciousness or whatever Mm. and and so now i am pure consciousness and i'm not my body and i'm just this one thing and you see people like um Jim Carrey, I don't know if you followed him when he got into his, what seems like a very nihilistic, um, he, 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 this is one seminal interview where he's talking to a reporter, super yeah, nihilistic, yeah. like, I don't exist, there's no Jim Carrey, there's no, and he's clearly, in my mind, uh, misunderstanding what this whole thing means to going the whole renunciation way of like, yeah, it's all meaningless. It all, it's all bullshit. I don't exist. This is just a, yeah. Um, right. Right. And so, so I don't, I don't know what I'm trying to get to here, but I, I think I, I want to somehow, have a sense, I think, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You go ahead then. Okay. Okay. Well, 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 you tell, you tell me if this, this captures some of what you're, you're getting. At. Okay. So there's a, mm-hmm. uh, a different kind of i mean it's, it ultimately it's related but but a, a sort of different kind of dualism that you know shows up in in people's experience and in like the western philosophical tradition of this sort of mind body dualism uh yes. where like you're like okay mind seems to be, have this sort of insubstantial uh quality that um there's this great phrase you know consciousness fa- fastened to the back of an animal where like it feels like uh there's this <laughs> this sort of pristine wonderful perfect thing that is consciousness and and our sort of human nature that knows things and that thinks and is 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 great and and yes. there's this shitty bodily you know like animalistic urges and needs and whatever and and that's all bound up with the world which is defective and 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 crappy and awareness yeah. is not and, and, and i mean uh, and and mind is not in the sort of uh, you know Cartesian version of this view, right? Like mind is is yeah. what's godly in us, and and the body is 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 not. And yeah, we're stuck in this we're stuck in this monkey suit. I think Joe Hudson said, "Explain right, like, right, yeah, yeah. We 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 feel we feel you know tied to it, but not not defined by it, and that's that that feels oppressive in some way. Like oh, like I, I you know uh, the Ernest right. Becker, you know, who wrote this famous book, The Denial of Death, way of putting it, is he's got we've got this like twin nature of of being you know embodied animalistic creatures and symbolic creatures and that tension Mm. produces us in us this this you know horrible sense of like like uh dissonance because 
part of us has this sense of you know we we ought to be immortal and the other part of us knows we're going to die and and that leads to all yeah anyway um so yes th- th- this this sense of tension between our worldly embodied impermanent you know uh animalistic existence and what it seems like to be a mind that has these sort of eternal thinking rational whatever qualities that that dualism can become very uh intense and yeah i think i think uh Harm, harmfully so and then yeah as you say if, if you move along some kind of spiritual path or something like that um mm-hmm. that that the opposition between those things can become less vivid but um yeah just to, just to, it, just to, it seems like a, a the same mistake just flipped on his head i i don't think it's necessarily more enlightened uh to 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 get stuck in the disassociative space where you're like really disowning your body um yeah yeah exactly uh it, yeah. like, like the, 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 uh, there, there are two sides of the same coin which points to how this sort of in uh monism and dualism contain each other and that they're sort of making the same error kind of thing but it's like uh mm. both of them are trying are like sort of rejecting a part of it a part of reality uh in order to get a sense of security and safety and stability and, and non-suffering right as you go like like uh like uh i want the the sort of nihilistic materialistic i mean now now we're very squarely in meaningless territory but it's like the nihilistic materialistic mm-hmm. all that matters is gratifying your apish needs uh is a sort of <laughs> defensive strategy right to say like like i'm not going to get fooled right, again right. by those higher purposes that that the other other idiots cling to i'm just going to gratify my needs and likewise right. the sort of airy fairy spiritual like you know the worldly existence is 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 bad uh i'm only going to be concerned with you know the refinements of my immaterial consciousness or something like that yeah that is also a that. defensive strategy of not yeah. wanting to get hurt by attachment to the world and you can hear the sort of sutric mm. quality of that too um, right yeah right 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 but um, so yeah go, maybe go we're coming to to the the um uh non-mistaken view of either extreme here before i say anything more uh well okay so so i guess there there are different ways we we might we might take it but yeah okay so so maybe one helpful thing to to add here would be just the the way this uh ties up with your your sort of deutschian view because obviously like philosophically that was part of what was putting you in that place was yep uh you know so deutsch deutsch is coming out of a sort of rationalistic tradition um and which which is a is a cartesian tradition and uh part of part of the sort of sense sense that that fosters is okay like he would say we're not the we're not the body we're the software running on the mind software is an (laughs) abstract thing right and Mm -hmm. and so we're this creative uh abstract thing that is software uh and if you try to sort of experience that and, and, and uh, you know, uh, part of what this entails is that like, you know, evolutionary psychology is bullshit or anything that would seem to tie us to a kind of animal nature an evolved mm-hmm. nature uh, isn't true because that would be to claim that, you know, there's some constraint on our creativity and that, you know, compute computation isn't universal, which gives us this faculty of, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, being able to come up with new ideas that, that free us from that animal nature, putting, putting aside like, like, there's a certain sense in which a bunch of that is true, I would say, but it doesn't have the implications I think that people think it has. Um, no, and but I, yeah. I think yeah. a, a big part of that, and now I'm speaking anecdotally from my perspective, but it seems to uh, ring true in general, is for you to truly, because um, the idea somehow is that that it's not human, like the those animal parts in the body. Uh, the genetic ideas and those things are are not. It's it's not the actions and and uh, wants of a person or whatever. Like the the mm. creative explanatory ideas are somehow higher. At least that's the way I read the whole thing. And I think yeah. the only way to achieve that uh, in practice is to repress a lot of who you actually are. Yeah, and 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 we should probably give credit um, to you know david and 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 other crit rats uh uh where they certainly wouldn't encourage the repression right like like part of the mm-hmm. part of the view 
uh, in the sort of, you know, most pragmatic applications of critical rationalism is you should take implicit ideas into account. You shouldn't be coercively endorsing some ideas at the expense of others. You know, like they, th there's no sense in which the refined versions of the philosophy explicitly endorse this repression, but it can be, the repression can be produced in, in people who, who adhere to it because there is the sense that, yeah, like, like, um, if you think you're the body, if you think you're, uh, just another ape, you are not, you know, embracing your status as, as a, as a person with a capital P, you know, uh, mm. that is, that is, uh, you know, the universal program running on the universal computer and that's creative, you know, like, like, yeah, that, um, so, yeah, so, so I think you could. I, I think you can take it one step further, even, and say because um, Deutsch on this podcast, when I had him on, actually said yeah. explicitly that he he doesn't think there's such a thing as human nature. Yeah, because of how we're uh, yeah explanatorily universal, and we can always change our genetic ideas. Whereas I'm starting to think more and more that certain needs and uh, desires might be. Uh, inescapable for thriving at least and not surviving i'm uh, thinking more about it and i know joe hudson who i mentioned before he also said that yeah we to to thrive people need good sex they need good relationships they need um closeness and connection to people and um, mm -hmm. i think deutsch would take take issue with that a lot and yeah i'm starting to lean towards hudson's view on that one of, one of the tricky things about this conversation is that people are talking at sort of two different levels. So, like, I, I, I would guess, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but if you press Deutsch, uh, he would admit that most people in their current state of mind and knowledge do would be made happier by those things. Like, do, in, in, in that sense, do need those things. Mm -hmm. What he wants to stress is a sort of philosophical and, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, philosophy of mind type claim that given that minds are universal uh, and that we can create new knowledge and that and uh, we're, we're not in any final sense you know uh, barring the creation of new knowledge like like um, we're not in any final sense bound by those kinds of desires and there is a sense in which like that's kind of true but like you're also talking of like in the limit what you're talking about is just like okay rearrange everything in your brain and everything every, every, like and 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 you know and your whole body and whatever else and yes in the limit you could yeah. rearrange everything yeah. about us and then we would no longer right. be human and then we no longer have human desires and like like uh i'm less and less compelled by that idea but um there but there is a yes. sense in which it's like it's uh philosophically justifiable if you if, if you don't take yeah. as significant the fact that you would have to rearrange everything about how you currently are as like uh as opposed to how you how you might be as an abstract computational thing um yeah yes and and i i mean i would say that this is another thing that i um and when i say i take issue with these things i mean I would hope I'm open to persuasion on all these things. I mean, if you had asked me a year ago, I would I would be arguing. Uh, I even did, I think, a few episodes ago. I, I, I thought I was strongly on the side of evolutionary psychology being bunk, right? So I hope I would be as plastic mm -hmm. again. But I, I feel strongly um, uh, against the idea that 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 meditation experiences or psychedelic experiences or anything of that kind necessarily tells you anything about uh, what's true outside of your experience. I mean, I, I definitely think that there are things to be learned there and there's value in them. I mean, I do a lot of it. But for instance, the claim that um, – the claim that there – Okay, there's no sense of self, for instance. If you look at your sense of self, it disappears. So therefore, you don't exist, which I know uh, is endorsed by a lot of people, not Sam Harris. But um, like, I, I feel like such a – it's easy to see conceptually that you, you can't – I think this is Alan Watts' point. Your eyes can't see themselves mm -hmm. and your, your uh, teeth can't bite themselves. And by definition, you can't 
stand outside of yourself to look at yourself. Uh, and in this similar vein, I feel like it's weird to say that, um, yeah, for instance, just I had this experience of pure consciousness or even Rigpa, like when I'm in Rigpa, okay, uh, it's a very open spaciousness and there doesn't seem to be a body or a self or anything like that. Um, that could just be how it feels to be a body and brain in a world. Like that's just the experiential side of existing as that. Like, do you see what I mean? Uh, there, there's yeah, no clear uh, the, line the, the, there. There's a whole, there's a whole bunch I want to unpack in this. Uh, 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 yeah. Okay. Do. I, 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 do, I do think I see what, see what you mean, but it, there are a couple things I want to clarify. So, um, right, right. First, uh, first off, with, with with respect to Rigpa, uh, there's nothing about Rigpa that says you don't feel the sensations of your body uh, or anything like 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 sometimes right, that can right. happen. But sure. yeah, like it 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 just bears over repeating. But because uh, because it's very easy to uh, get confused about this, like mm-hmm. any experience you can have is coincident with with rigpa <laughs> it's the nature of mind all the time right you can right. feel super like a body whatever else yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a sense, a sense in which aware yeah. awareness no longer feels bound by that uh mm-hmm. by the, the, those appearances when rigpa is recognized but yeah it, it uh it's not in any sense dependent upon you know you're having a super uh of disembodied course, experience or p- pure consciousness or anything like that okay so uh, to, to backtrack a little bit to um uh you know you can't see your face um so so the the assumption that on the basis of some you know recognition of of non-duality experientially the 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 claim that there's no self okay so i want to i want to backtrack a little bit but uh there's a sense in which i t- i agree with what you said uh like the person still exists but there was an assumption in what you said that i don't agree with which is that mm. uh, knowing in general is dualistic, uh, which I think actually isn't true, and I actually don't think. Um, uh, uh, How did I uh, put Deutsch that? would endorse How, well, it? What but, did I say that implied that? Uh, basically, like, like, like. Okay, just be, just because you can't see your own face doesn't mean that's not the thing doing the knowing. <laughs> uh, or like just because no, just, just no, eyes can't no. see themselves doesn't mean there isn't something behind them doing the knowing, right? Right, right, right. No, 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 no. No, that's not what I meant. I meant the actual – no, I meant the eyeballs can't see I, – I meant in terms of not um, – we have to differentiate between the phenomenology, um, phenomenological duality and just a duality between uh, – an existing organism and the experience that that organism has. Yeah, but I would also say uh, that the the, I mean, agreed that those two things are different. But I also don't think the the organism and its environment are dual in any final sense either. Like, uh, no, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you don't have my phenomenological experience, presumably. And I don't yeah, have yours, yeah. so I mean, yeah, 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 right, right. No, yeah, I, 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 I can agree with that. Um, there was something else I was going to say related to this em- embodiment thing. Um, mm-hmm. okay, okay, so, so you know, ostensibly this is the Chapman series, so maybe I'll, I'll make one, one point to sort of connect this to, to the, the Chapman material and why this is all germane. But, um. Do you remember a while ago I sent you that that uh, philosophized this podcast about Nietzsche and true world theories? Yes, it, it, was, it was a long time ago, but yeah. Although um, I don't, I don't distinctly remember. I, the I will very, ideas, I will very, but I very quickly it. Re- recap it. But uh, yeah. uh, it, it can be a little bit confusing to people to to uh, see the. Um, it was certainly confusing for me to see what all this all these stuff 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 we're saying about rationalism has to do mm-hmm. with this other spiritual stuff that we're saying about, you know, meditative experience and and that kind of duality, right? Mm-hmm. Um like like why why does Deutsch's claim about epistemology like have anything to do with this weird spiritual esoterica? And mm-hmm. at least for me, this frame helped sort of make some of this clearer. So, um Nietzsche uh um uses this term true world theories to describe what humans throughout history have done to essentially like reconcile themselves to 
the fact of their own deaths and and you know the sort of uh the 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 problem of the world feeling horribly defective right like mm. like uh like life is unsatisfactory we're in, we're shackled to a body all all, all of these aspects of, of life that are uh, appear to be defective um mm-hmm. you know how how have people not in the face of that succumbed to nihilism and you know he said the, the, the way that we do that is <laughs> right. that we invent these true world theories you know um be it a sort of uh platonist true world theory of like there's a world of eternal forms out there that you know like yes the the defective appearances of my senses aren't the real thing but they're shadowy reflections of the world of eternal forms in which everything is perfect right or in a christian context it would be you know there's a heaven there so like this world is shitty and whatever but the point is to like get your (laughs) house in order in this world and then you'll end up in the perfect world when you die right and even that just the, yes. that parallel between the Platonist thing, which is ostensibly like sort of like philosophical rationalist type view, and then and then the the heaven thing is a little bit subversive, right? Because it's saying these two things in some sense uh, are the same, uh, or like are motivated by the same psychological desires and needs. Um, which is yeah, uh, yeah. This world seems defective in some way, so we're going to posit another world that doesn't have the de- defects of this one, and then and then use that to orient and. Um, now, the Deutsch, Deutschian rationalist, critical rationalism doesn't seem to have anything to do with that, but it does end up taking on some of these characteristics. And then it's not an accident that you ended up in a kind of rejection of the body type place, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, adhering to that philosophical view right and then the, the spirituality right, right. stuff sort of shook up even, even though it doesn't seem like epistemology and, and spirituality should have much to do with each other it's 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 not an accident that it got uh, shaken up because there are these sort of existential needs that would lead one to to find appealing a view that says uh in principle reality is controllable or in prince like like uh, which right, which is one right. of the things that rationalism suggests, right? That like if everything is perfectly definite and precise and whatever, even if it's only in the world of abstractions, that gives us the possibility of knowledge and and therefore manipulation and prediction and control that would make us existentially mm-hmm. safe in some in some way. I'm 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 skimming over what meaningness is basically about here, but that, that's that's right. uh, yeah, yeah yeah yeah. But just just to I give like it. it it helps it helps point to why the, these conversations we have about epistemology are not are not totally separate from this stuff about um spirituality because they do they do go together and then Mm. um and these different these different kinds of so you get a sense here too of the the motivation for for dualisms of various kinds which is some part of experience seems to be defective and so you repress it in order to uh or like create the sense of a rift or a sense of separation in order to uh uh not have to deal with that apparent defectiveness of experience and then the most basic version of that just to bring everything full circle is the sense that i a separate subject uh am am permanent and enduring and solid and separate and whatever uh Mm -hmm. from the world right uh because because the most basic sort of need driving our you know cognition and experience is this sense that we need to like continue to exist right and so the the primordial sort of rift in experience, like the primordial sort of dualistic fixation, is that kind of me not me thing that allows me to yeah. prop up my sense of myself as enduring and 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 substantial and solid. Um, but beneath it all the time is this kind of need, like the, this existential need to to be at peace and feel safe in the world. That was a little bit of a, a ramble, but you kind of know where no, no, I'm no. going. I love that, and I want to add to that that um, it's so beautifully paradoxical and counterintuitive that, um, yeah, b- by by doing that uh, dualistic fixation and contracting and clinging and be- into small self behind the face, you are, um, like you're effectively. You're you're failing to do what you want. You're you're failing to find yourself in a way, which is this this openness that is different but not separate from the world. 
and mm-hmm. I've 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 um, come to experience more and more for myself now that also paradoxically, the more I have let go of myself in that small sense and uh, let go of any need to define myself or box myself in or say I'm just the mind and not the body or whatever. Uh, and the less I've beca- be- the less I've um, come to believe in free will as as an internal locus of control in any sense, uh, mm-hmm. the more I feel influenced by by the organ um, the the world, the environment, people around me. The more I've never felt more agency, and I've never felt <laughs> like more of a, a strong individual. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's so fucking <laughs> beautiful, man. I, <laughs> I love yeah, this yeah. shit. No, uh, like there's yeah, it, like there's a sense in which when you stop clinging to some fixed sense of what you are it's much easier to become who you are like when you stop clinging to control it's much easier to yes. exert agency and all, all these different weird paradoxes yeah <laughs> it's so cool um, yeah, and like so those awesome. words don't mean what you thought they meant from the standpoint of, of the prior condition you know like like no it's um, much better this, yeah it's this, much this is actually one, much better. one one rare you know it's not really a point of disagreement but like uh i think this is a place where people can get confused listening to sam harris is obviously he also he, he ties together this you know illusoriness of the self thing with the illusoriness of free will and he'll even mm-hmm. say like the illusion of free will is an illusion which is like the sense that you have of having free will is born of an illusion uh yeah. which is which is the illusoriness of the self so it's not only that we don't have free will it's that we don't even feel like we have free will when that's seen clearly <laughs> yeah. you know um <laughs> and uh in his terms i think that's right but yeah. but um, oh, Harris. there's there's another sense of f- quote unquote free will that or, or or agency you might say that that i don't mm-hmm. think is illusory and, and then people tend to run the two of them together which is that mm-hmm. uh and 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 chapman will talk about this where you know um the misimpression that you could get is that, okay if you don't have free will in this sort of fully separate sense of an independent subject who's authoring the actions and can do anything and is independent of any causation like obviously that doesn't exist but um the misimpression you can then get from that is oh i'm a puppet of the world and yes it's that's, only an external locus of control right and that that's that, that's like a like a sort of flipping the error to the other side um yeah, and in it. reality causality is constantly passing back and forth between inside and yes. outside and and there's not a sense of separation. There's there's not a, a separation between those two, but it can be helpful to talk about um, inside and outside for some purposes. And it's like, yeah, that's what's going on. You know, like, like, which... I mean, thank God for that, because how boring would it be if nothing in the world or what you said right now could have any influence on me? Like, that sounds like the most yeah. boring world to have complete that's a, that's control. A path, that's a path to nihilism, right? Like, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, right? I, like, yeah, yeah. I heard someone say that that's the the analogy is to playing a video game on uh, God mode all the time or whatever. Right, like, you right. just, <laughs> it's so boring. Like in uh, Mario Kart, when you get the star and you're immortal for a few seconds, so boring if you were like that all the time or whatever. Yeah, yeah well, it, it's all, it's also like a world, I mean, uh, this, okay, so, so to go back to the true world theories thing, um, mm-hmm. Another thing that that gets put in this bucket by Nietzsche of, of true world theories is the sort of Kantian separation between noumena and phenomena, right? And so like, and and there's a there's a version of this that I kind of endorse, uh, which is just this like strictly like there, there's you know like a hard problem of consciousness type view, but but mm-hmm. this is basically this idea that there's the world of appearances and then there's the world of things in themselves, and we never have access to the world of things in themselves. We just have access to the world of appearances and there's really nothing we can say about the relationship between the world of appearances and the world of things in themselves. And right. um, that has a kind of dualism in it too, uh, where like you can see how that would lead to nihilism because it's like we never affect the world and the world never affects us, or at least there's nothing we can say about how the world affects us. And so it's yeah. like, here we are just playing in this illusory world of appearances. Again, like like there are versions of that that are like uh, to go back to the emptiness thing there are versions of that that are helpful and true but philosophically i think that's wrong like like we're in yeah. and of the world i mean like we're 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 bumping up into the world uh the world is affecting us we're affecting the world back and forth all the time um and it is that ongoing dynamic interaction that is the the condition of of uh meaning and trying to like like being merely externally caused would 
be a kind of nihilism, but also being and the, the 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 traditional sort of I want to have free will, the like merely internally caused um, would also be a condition of nihilism in some sense because you, you're out of connection to the world, like you're just yeah, it's just flowing from you, the disembodied separate subject. That, you know, yeah, it doesn't doesn't really make sense. No, no, it doesn't. So, um, awesome. We're halfway, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's uh, part one. Part one of seven. Yes, Here we go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, before I jump into my next talking point, I, I wanna I wanna touch on the um, non duality and emotional fluidity and how they might uh, tie together or not. I think that yeah. is adjacent to what we've spoken about already here. But let's. Um, get a Twitter question in there because I feel like this is relevant. We've kind of answered some of it here, but let's see. This one we got today, it's from all my eyes, dude. Raris Mircea. Yep. What are the things you lose along with the dual eternalist meaning egocentric way of being? How is friendship, falling in love, eroticism, I like this guy, movie watching, boxing, Affected by this transformation, should we, can we preserve these highly meaningful, unique experiences? And so I'd like to hear how you read that, but it sounds like, yeah, he's kind of afraid of the, if you, if you lose the sense of self, you lose all the good stuff. Um, Right. Well, this, this would also be a good place to reassert my disclaimer that I'm not speaking from the condition of enlightenment as I, as I, uh, oh, or, don't, you know, or, don't worry, or, or I am, man. As I say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you, you can represent the enlightened voice in this conversation and we'll, we'll bounce yes. it off your experience. But uh, <laughs> this is, this is sort of what we've been talking about the whole time, right? Like, no, no, uh, yeah. uh, none of, none of that gets the lost. opposite it actually is, is true. Uh, yeah, it is different. I mean, a lot of, a lot of that stuff is different. I would, I would say that, than it is, from the condition of you know dualistic fixation or whatever but but no mm-hmm. there's nothing in principle that says all those things have to be lost and that's that's uh that's a consequence of of not having the sort of uh sutric view um of, of yeah you have to renounce all the sort of characteristics of worldly experience in order to get to some enlightened state like it's like no it's <laughs> uh all of that's still there it's empty um but mm-hmm. but that's not uh, to claim to say it is empty is not a nihilistic claim on this view, you know. So, yeah. No, and and once again, somewhat paradoxically, from the normal view, um, and Alan Watts. Uh, well, there is an Alan Watts video I think called "Let Go" on YouTube. That's like seven minutes, where he speaks mm. about how non-attachment to the world. Uh, or wait, does he call it that? He calls it something like that. But it doesn't mean not being engaged. And yeah. he says something like, it's not until you you stop this clinging to sensory experiences, uh, which are empty, as you explained, that you can truly enjoy sense pleasure. This is a very tantric way of speaking about it, I guess. But yeah, he said yeah. that's when you can really enjoy pleasure in the most... Uh, lip licking frolicky kind of a way and then he laughs um yeah i think it's awesome it's uh yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 and and again if like if, if this sounds like implausible just it's very easy to see this with like sound right so like like uh mm. you're hearing sound imagine if you were listening to a song and throughout the song you were just like trying to <laughs> stop it from going on right like like Oh wait, go back to that previous note or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, like go back to you know, like, like hold on. I want to play. I want to play that last you know point two seconds yeah. again because I, I want to. We're trying to have full control and and writing every song that you listen to in your head yeah exactly. exactly. It's, just, it's, just, it's like uh, obviously you'd want to let go of that to mm-hmm. uh, so to speak in order to appreciate the song, and it's just the same thing as just true of all. Like first off, you can't stop the song anyway so it's it's futile but also like yeah a, a, a possibility of much greater enjoyment is available if if, if you don't do that uh, to experience so yeah that's great and now i won't be uh having a uh, guilty conscience for never answering the twitter questions i ask for <laughs> um <laughs> all right so yeah so the emotional fluidity thing i guess what i'm thinking here is i actually spoke to joe hudson about this specifically too that 
I asked him about non-duality. And I don't know, did you hear that episode where he spoke about this and his experience? I might have. Uh, re- refresh me. I, I, I feel like I might have, but, but re- re- refresh me on what he said. Right. Well, that's sweet of you not wanting to hurt my feelings because I know you didn't listen to it, right? No, 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 but, no. Um... There's, one, there's one of them that I did listen to. Um, yeah. That... But, but um, I also have heard him on other podcasts talk about this stuff too. So, but uh, oh, re- refresh right. me. Cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so what he said to me was basically that he, he had the, the type of, I'm not sure if he's, he's using non-dual like in the perfect Dzogchen way, but I, I mm. guess it's close enough to that experience, I would say. But he had some th- this type of experience at a retreat, and then he spent basically eight years just sitting in a room meditating, um, uh, which is intense. And then he – so so he, he like makes this distinction between um, – well, first of all, he has this uh, this idea of – you can get stuck in non-duality, but I guess that's uh, that would be like clinging to emptiness, maybe from the Dzogchen view. Of yeah, yeah. Once again, not, becoming non, non-duality kind of, often gets confused for emptiness, and and in the same way that I gets think, confused for mo- monism. But yeah, yeah, I think this is the way he uses it. Um, uh, and so, so he he is kind of he said he had a period where he was against non-duality or where he was advising people <laughs> against it because they had what he considers non-dual experience but without the joy because of uh, lack of the emotional fluidity which entails strong embodiment and being really in touch with emotions and yeah. um and so i guess and he also has this view of constant evolution uh, where it's like, there's no, I'm not sure what Dzogchen would say on this, but there's no such thing as reaching any final realization. Um, and I guess this, this depends on where you stand on the whole, can you have direct experience into the nature of mind? Is there, um, yeah, yeah. His view is essentially just that it never ends the, the evolution of, uh, who you are and how you see the world and and how you uh, experience the world is always going to be evolving. So there's mm. no final enlightenment, as it were. And um, and so what I'm curious about, I guess, is <clears throat> we've spoken about that before privately. That I don't, uh, I don't have a formal meditation practice. You do, so y- you do m- more of that formal stuff. And whereas I've gotten to a lot of, uh. The same experiences, uh, presumably, I think I know what uh, uh, no self type consciousness means. I don't. I, I yeah. I feel like I experience that quite frequently, and um, but but I have a very embodied account, as I said before, and so I'm curious. And and emotion is a big part of it, and and really feeling mm-hmm. emotion and being embracing. Um, uh, embrace instead of brace uh, everything that comes into experiences with love, right? So you can even love panic. I had an experience the other day of truly feeling panic and paranoia and it not being a problem uh, when mm-hmm. there was no resistance there. And so, um, so yeah, so I guess the question is what uh, – do, do you see not the, the non-dual type Rigpa as including <laughs> this uh, – this emotional fluidity of being fully expressed in your joy and your love and sadness and all the emotions. Um, yeah. Or do you think, do you think that are the same thing? Do you think one has something that the other is missing? Yeah. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Hearing me say this. Uh, yeah. Okay. 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 So, so there's, there's, there's some context I would, I would want to give, but the, the short answer is definitely like, yes. I mean, to, to go back to the sort of thing I'm always harping on, which is like, like, <laughs> Rigpa is coincident with any experience. Like uh, uh, it's it's already right, true. Right, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but, right. uh, I'll, 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 but but uh, so so yes. If you think that Rigpa in terms of suffering less, I guess. Like... No, but 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 it, it is an important distinction, right? So like, it's not about not having certain emotions. It's not about yes. not ha- like not certain things not being allowed to arise. It's not none of that. Like if if you think you need to have a certain particular state in order for you know the uh, nature of mind to be manifest you are mistaken it, it wouldn't be the nature of mind right <laughs> like like right, that's right, that's right, right. very 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 important but okay to to 
that's the short version, but I'll give you the sort of like um, uh, contextualized version a little bit. So uh, this is where actually the the alternate framing of what's going on in Rigpa that isn't um, the sort of Sam Harris framing of uh, it's just recognition of the illusory of the self, um, but rather this idea that it's the union of clarity and emptiness. Uh, this is where that framing can be very helpful and you can get a sense of how specific the thing is that that uh, you know, Dzogchen practitioners are referring to when they're talking about Rigpa. So, uh, and it goes to J- Joe Hudson's talking about, you know, being against non-duality or something like that. Like, that's not the non-duality that they're talking about. Um, mm-hmm. If he's like, you know, uh, I'm against non-duality because I'm in favor of emotions. That's not the non-duality no. that they're talking about. Or like, I'm no, against uh, non-duality. Be- be- yeah. No, just to be fair to him, he said I had a that he had a phase where he was talking uh, people out of what he what he considered uh, non duality. That yeah, disassoci- yeah, no, I, to, I'm, to I'm avoid not saying this is where he landed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 cool. Yeah, so so very, but very explicitly in this, I'll, I'll actually I'll try to pull up this quote so, so I can get it exactly right. But um, uh, very explicitly in this in the presentation of Zogchen, uh, that would be an overemphasis on the emptiness aspect of it. So I'll, I'll read this, yes. this line. Um, um, uh, it says, in, in Dzogchen, Rigpa, or recognizing mind essence, uh, has three qualities or aspects. The empty essence, uh, which we talked about, the lucid or cogn- cognizant nature, this spontaneous knowing quality, and their indivisible unity. When our meditation practice strays from Rigpa, two things can happen. We can overemphasize the empty aspect, causing a kind of blockage, because although it is Mm. thought free, it still involves a kind of subtle clinging. There's a stuckness, a lack of naturalness, fluidity, and awareness of the unconfined capacity or totally open nature of genuine Rigpa. Okay, so that's the first error. And you can already hear how that relates to what you're just talking about, right? Mm -hmm. The other mistake is as if, on the other hand, we overemphasize the clarity or lucid aspect, we can become fixated on that and lose the awareness of inner space. That's the more habitual sort of dualistic fixation thing of like clinging to the need to know, you know, you can think of it that way. Um, Mm -hmm. Therefore, this subtle art involves unifying the experience of the empty nature and lucidity such that the third quality of inseparability, the the union of emptiness and clarity may naturally and spontaneously manifest. Okay, so that's a very down the middle uh, traditional Tibetan uh, presentation of what Rigpa is. But you can hear there uh if 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 you you know got non-dual and i i i I understand that this is not where joe hudson end up but it's like if if you're like "Ah, i i recognize non-duality but then i was like oh you know like but i want emotions and i want i want i want worldly existence and i want all this stuff and and i I don't think everything's just empty and thought free and 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 bliss and detached and dissociated and whatever that's very clearly on this uh uh, overemphasis on the empty aspect causing a kind of clinging and blockage because it's pre- mm-hmm. it's inhibiting the unconfined totally open nature of genuine rigpa as he says right you, you, yes so so that's where this this particular like very precise standard for what constitutes rigpa is 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 helpful because yeah many 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 people be, be, again because people start from the condition of like dualistic fixation they mm-hmm. mistake recognition of emptiness for the full recognition of rigpa and then yes. and then and then go oh this seems defective in some way because to keep the emptiness up i can't let whatever whatever arise right um mm-hmm. so it'd be, it'd be like stopping after the first of the four knowledge doors, you know like ah, i've arrived at no thought well this is pretty blissful but nothing's really happening you know it's like like no wrong yeah. wrong <laughs> yeah wrong it wrong conclusion um Okay, so now to, to to your question about emotional fluidity and whether it's the same thing or whatever. Okay, so having established that there's nothing about Rigpa that would inhibit that kind of emotional fluidity, I think there's still a separate question of like, you know, like, is it enough to get the kind of emotional benefits that you've gotten from, from the different practices that you've done um, to just like, you know do a buddhist practice like a a zokchen practice i don't i mean in principle yes in some sense probably but but no in another sense like like i certainly don't only try to do you know zokchen practice and 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 not do anything else you know never do a sort of therapeutic practice or whatever like like there are many Mm -hmm. other aspects to working with form than just recognizing the non-duality of emptiness and form you know like like it's it's um 
Uh, and so, so uh, the, there's a certain sense in which fluidity, as you're describing it, I mean, that, that word is already in there, right? Like, like clinging to emptiness involves a lack of naturalness, fluidity, and awareness of the unconfined capacity or totally open, na- open nature of yeah. Drake, but, right? So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like fluidity is a consequence of nonfixation. So in that, that's the sense in which they're related. But mm-hmm. yeah, that you can go through the emotional door first, you know, and, and, and don't have to have this sort of hyper Buddhist sense of yeah, yeah anyway. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. No, th- that's re- that's a very interesting answer because I think this is where the the disagreement I have with Harris on this stuff lies, um, and I think he's mistaken on this. And so, um, hot take. <laughs> yeah, it is. And I mean, did did you want to say anything more on that before I before I go into? Why well, if you, if, you, if, you, if you want, if you want to disparage him, I mean, I, I I can anticipate this and say I bet there's a way in which he's not saying what you're about to say he's saying. But but go ahead, go ahead. I mean, I, I, I want to hear it. If and if that's the case in, in in a very true Sam Harris spirit, if that's the case, I would like to know that, and uh, I'm I'm fully fully open to the fact that I might be mis. Uh, interpreting him and and if i am and maybe he listens to this i'm gonna think of a catchy title to the episode to get him to listen because that'd be awesome you, sh- you should call but, it uh, sam harris listen to this podcast episode <laughs> <laughs> i do want to call it do you even rig pub bro yeah, yeah, but uh yeah we'll go. see but um yeah so 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 if i'm wrong about it i will recant it immediately and i'm very open to that being the case and this is also something that i haven't I I never, almost never sit and explicitly think things through. This is just an intuition I've had, and I try to figure out why, like, 15 minutes before the podcast. So I'm thinking Good. out loud here. Yeah, so I've listened to everything Sam Harris has put out, almost. And the, the, the two main things where he's talked explicitly about this that I'm drawing upon are from... Uh, fairly uh, one is from the most recent AMA and one is from a fairly recent AMA and then the rest I just think falls from the way he speaks about uh, these things and mm-hmm. so um, the the whole debate is about whether it is of value and or necessary to work with understanding one's past and Essentially, a view of mind that differs, because he he seems to think that, yeah, the monkey mind model of the mind, as I call it, where the mind is out of control, and that's basically the essential nature of the mind. You Mm. can uh, calm this by practicing uh, different types of meditation and by training your mind. He makes draws the analogy to exercise there, physical exercise. And um, he has said explicitly that one guy asked him recently uh, about, uh, yeah, some people think that memories that come up uh, re- um, many times and that has like strong emotional content behind them are somehow, there's something there that's unprocessed. Mm. Uh, what do you think of this? And his answer there was uh, shortly summarized that no, the thing that matters is what you do in this moment. And in this moment, you can always choose to see through. Well, choose is a funny word there, but you always have the option to to see through the illusory sense of self and mm. thus uh, let go from that memory and, yeah, get free of it that way. And that was fairly explicitly how he said that. And then he's answered another time somebody asked about the Jordan Peterson self-authoring program, like where Jordan recommends you go through your past really intensely and see wherever you're charged emotionally, there's something that you haven't worked through. And then you can mm-hmm. identify what you need to work with there, right? And yeah. he he gave the same type of answer there. And um and also, actually, his his view on psychedelic trips <laughs> and how he said many times that bad trips just happen, basically. Uh, sure, you can control for set and setting and other things, but you might just be really unlucky to to have bad trips. And for him personally, that started happening to the extent that every trip had a lot of bad in it and he stopped doing it altogether, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um and he seems to be putting that down to more or less random chance. Um, and 
my view um, opposing that is that thoughts in general, the mind, the structure of the mind is not as random as that. It's not the case that a mind is by nature messy and chaotic and all over the place. Uh, I think that if you have a lot of thinking along the same lines, a lot of looping thoughts, things like that, I lean more towards the the Joe Hudson type model where you have underlying unfelt, unprocessed emotions. um, And if you can integrate those and acknowledge those and let them surface, you can literally get rid of whole chunks of mind chatter and the voice and even chunks of your whole personality things that I've experienced myself. And um, I also think there's a strong, strong somatic component where maybe like you said there with Rigpa, that Rigpa can equalize any experience uh, in a sense. Like in the, like equalize might be the wrong way of talking about no, yeah, it. The, uh, in a, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I want to let you finish your full, full disparagement yeah. and then I'm going to jump in. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it can, in a sense, you can have all the emotional baggage in the world, presumably, recognize the illusoriness of the self, and in the moment of doing that, being completely free from the suffering of whatever that is. Um, but I think there also, also there's there's a f- further way which involves this very embodied account and emotional fluidity account. Mm. where you've exhausted all the unprocessed stuff that I still think um, is very physical. And I, I, I like the idea of mind tension being body tension in a very strong sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that you don't, it, it's not, I think non-duality might be uh, part of that naturally. I think the more you dissolve that, the more the voice dissolves, the more the sense of self dissolves. This is something I'm experiencing myself. Um, and I, so I, I think that's more of a natural state you can reach that way where you don't have to kind of, yeah, you, you don't have to work to recognize that selfless nature to escape the suffering because the suffering isn't there in the first place. But yeah, that's a, uh, uh, a somewhat messy okay. account of what I think I think right now. All right. Let me, let me, let me, let me see if I can uh, state some of it back to you and then, and then I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll, yeah. Okay. So, so the the overall view. I mean, you, you did say this sort of at the beginning, right? The, there's an overall yeah. intuition you have about about the way Sam Harris tends to talk about these things. That mm-hmm. uh, what what the real psychological work to be done is to recognize in any given moment the illusoriness of the self, and everything the every sort of traditional psychological uh, you know therapeutic presentation that would suggest that you need to somehow process your emotions or get your life history story right or figure out when something you know w- why you have a particular kind of reactivity or whatever else Every, everything that like happens in time everything that has this kind of like narrative character all of that pales in comparison to just in this moment are you going to recognize the illusoriness of the self and then equalize experience and there's a fear there of what what gets called like spiritual bypassing, right? Which is that like rather than engage with your stuff, you just transcend it, and and it might not ever get processed in any meaningful sense. But you're no longer suffering because of it, because you're in this you know nice spiritual spiritually bypassed place of having transcended it. I, I know that you said right. more things there, but that that's the intuition yeah, that you have yeah, that yeah. that like you're suspicious of. Uh, I think so. I it might be somewhat weaker than that. I'm sure that Harris would um, acknowledge. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go on that, to say but... I don't think I don't think any of that is true of his of his his actual view. But 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 oh, that's that's the intuition. That that's the that's the intuition you have about the problem, right? I think so, and it's currently a strong conviction, loosely held. So I'm very curious to hear what Great. you have okay. to say about that. But but also, actually, I just want to add this to it that. Uh, I actually am am not sure myself how much the biographical nature is needed. Mm. Uh, I do think that the 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 current the, the, like somat- current the somatic side of yes, it and stuff like that. Yeah, you yeah. can process it today. It's still there today without going too far into your bio- biography. But I think that's yeah. indispensable. Yes, and I don't think he would say that. Cool. Okay. So um, I, I I understand. I understand. I think that that critique. Um, cool two 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 things so one one is it's helpful to just sort of um 
make a distinction between what people understand themselves to be doing in therapy and what they what they're doing in a in a meditation practice especially like a buddhist mm. meditation practice so they are just different projects they obviously have a ton of overlap and they're related and they mutually reinforce each other in various ways but they are like different projects and the the meditation project is for lack of a better term like ha happiness independent of conditions which really means mm. you've got to be dealing with experience in terms that are independent of the particular forms that are showing up right so mm -hmm. if, if if you're going to really be talking about happiness independent of conditions you don't then also get to say but the conditions have to be emotionally fluid and, and i have to be having positive emotions right like uh uh because then it wouldn't be really about happiness independent of conditions that doesn't mean that recognizing rigpa for example doesn't afford lots of emotional fluidity and, and and just better general feelings but but if it's really going to be about recognizing the nature of mind you don't get them to, to say the nature of mind is only true when i'm having positive feelings or something like that you know like it, it, it has to be independent of conditions where conditions are understood to be particular form appearing right um um in right. a particular way right and and it's it's the uh if that weren't true then your other your other set of issues that we've been talking about earlier in this conversation would, would wouldn't be resolvable either because it's like uh it, r it wouldn't really be coincident with with any experience right <laughs> like 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 yourself would be a spiritual obstacle again right like like oh myself feels really blocky right now uh i guess i, I guess i'm not at rigpa <laughs> that that would be a problem too right so so the 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 it's, it's essential that 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 um rigpa not be defined relative to any particular appearance does that make sense so it's, it's got to be independent of conditions in that sense however okay and then, and then the, the therapy project is much more I, i'm not saying they're not related but i'm just like i'm going to give the separate presentation of them and then and then talk about how i think they're related yep okay okay so the therapy project is much more about having positive feelings <laughs> uh, uh, to, to getting rid of uh not, not getting rid of them in sort of like a uh, rejection sense but but yeah feeling better right like like f having a better mood all the time like having better behavior in your life right like all these kinds of things it, it, it it's dealing in the world of form so to speak and trying to improve it which is a totally worthwhile project to do right um now as you say the interesting thing that one can notice when you sort of go further and further down especially in like somatic terms down the therapy path is that there's obviously like something related to what's going on in meditation or yeah as you say you can have these huge chunks of personality fall away or you can have mm -hmm. uh or like th th these patterns that you no longer fall into or you get a much much more emotional fluidity or you no longer feel like such a separate self and then you're like okay these seem to be very related projects if not exactly the same one um okay so how how do i think they're broadly related and then we can talk about whether whether sam harris falls into some sort of error so um uh so so, so let me just add before you do that the the yep. um the emotional fluidity entails also being embraceive of of all experience and it doesn't make the distinction anymore between positive and negative emotion so yep. it's it's kind of similar in that sense and then i would add to um to what you're going to say next here that it, it seems like an um another similarity is the inherent there seems to be something of uh an inherently loving uh character to rigpa i don't know if it's rigpa specifically but certain meditation mm -hmm. uh traditions which would be on par with being emotionally fluid and having excavated all the uh piped up emotion as it were cleaned the pipe gives you access to much more bliss and joy and love and connection so there yeah. might be something similar there too well yeah but you, you, so you, now you're making my case for me right which is that like oh okay. uh, <laughs> well, yeah well <laughs> it, 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 as i mean as you just said right like rig properly understood is going to be coincident with and, and basically this, uh yeah it's certainly going to support it might actually just like produce uh emotional fluidity right like in in the sense that you want <clears throat> to in the sense that you want to defend Right. And and all of this sort of OK, so so to so go back to, to what you're saying about like, like, do you need to process emotions? OK, 
Say say you yes. were going to endorse the therapeutic view and, and say, I'm going to process all my emotions now, right? Like, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to take this memory that is supercharged for me and that triggers me and whatever and process it now. Now, yep. what actually happens when you process your emotions? Well, you no longer impede them. You, you, like, you feel them, but you feel them in a kind of condition of non- non-reactivity so that you're not like re-traumatizing yourself in some sense you're like you're mm -hmm. really being able to feel them you're feeling them from a view i mean to take out like a sort of let's take internal family systems because it's most obvious in this case right uh in ifs you're trying to get into self with a capital s where self has which self is understood not to be another part but the view from which parts mm -hmm. are known when you're right. not fused with them and self right. has these intrinsic characteristics of curiosity, calm, confidence, compassion, clarity, etc. Right. Um, and from, so you unblend from your, this is IFS language, you unblend from your parts and then you take them one by one. You sort of like dialogue with them from this condition of open awareness, which is, as you say, intrinsically loving, open, compassionate, non-rejecting, because if you were rejecting it, if there was something in you that didn't like this part, that would be understood in an IFS frame to to be a fusion with another part. So you you want to unblend from all the other parts, and and then and then you can relate what once you've unblended or are defused from these other parts, you can relate to any given part from a p position of openness, calm, confidence, compassion, etc. And then that in itself, obviously obviously IFS tends to include, uh, especially in the beginning much more of like a dialoguing component you're dealing with more with more with concepts but really yeah. i mean the further along i'm sure this is probably your experience the further along you get there the more somatic it is and yeah. the more kind of instantaneous it is right like if you can get into that stance the less wordless yeah yeah or, or, or the more wordless rather yeah like the the less words yeah the fewer words oh yeah, yeah. The, the less yeah. wordy i meant yeah 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 um so, i'm so forgetting like, like, the meaning of words even yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you're getting less wordy now uh, uh so <laughs> if you can get into that stance with respect to a part that's intrinsically mm -hmm. healing to that part and that's everything i mean it's, it's most of what you would want it, there's some other stuff about behavior change that we can talk about, but 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 that's most of what we would want with respect to this therapeutic aim of quote unquote processing your emotions. Now I'm going to claim that that's basically mm -hmm. the same fucking thing. Like self in, in 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 IFS is just the same fucking thing as Rigpa, like like less defined I, in a less refined way. Uh, I believe that, and it also yeah. it, and I ho hope so because then I have more weight behind calling myself enlightened and, and becoming a guru and having a cult and all that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. But I so, 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 uh, uh, to 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 caution a little bit against that, what I don't think is true is that I mean, like, like when I say it's the same thing as Rigpa, I don't mean that everything every IFS practitioner calls self is is as refined as Rigpa, because there's such a high standard for what constitutes Rigpa in a in a in 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 Dzogchen, and that's very helpful mm. because they're 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 engaged they understand themselves to be engaged not in like a life improvement project but in that the end of suffering <laughs> project right which is yeah, like yeah, such yeah. a high bar no, absolutely and then absolutely. you have to get all the way into these really really subtle like are you a little bit clinging to emptiness type things and but i'm going to claim that those two things are going to converge in the limit where if you try to follow the ifs path to the end of suffering you'd eventually have to start dealing in in like the subtleties that constitute this high standard of Rigpa and you wouldn't really be dealing conceptually anymore with with you know like like the details of your life history and your parts that protect other parts and stuff so much you know yeah, yeah. but but wait you said the, the two things that were the same in the limit was f full emotional fluidity if you Rigpa? tried to if you tried to ride the the uh now i'm just because uh, when i have the most experience with uh, if you tried to ride the ifs train to mm -hmm. to all the way to the end of suffering uh yes it would end up looking more and more like Zogchen practice, I would say. Right. I, I think that's right. I th I'm, I'm glad we're hashing this out. I think... Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that emotional fluidity taken to its extreme is this, the same exact thing of non-clinging. I mean, just the way of speaking about embracing versus bracing seems to be very indicative of that to me. Yeah. Um, and, and there is no suffering without embrace, uh, without bracing, which is what I was talking about when I, I said, I, you know, feeling panic and paranoia did, wasn't a problem. 
anymore, mm. which yeah. is, I mean, the, 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 you can't get more of a problem than that in terms of being uh, alive and feeling things, right? Yeah. Um, but what, what you're saying but, right now just is the same as what Sam Harris is saying when he says the important yeah, thing is well, how you contend with the emotion as it arises now. Whether you're rejecting that it depends, and, I think. and 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 well, well, well. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying there are, aren't different doorways in. Like it, the it might mm -hmm. not be a helpful practice instruction in many cases to say just recognize the illusoriness mm -hmm. of the self, right? Like it might be much better to say, you know, feel these feelings with an open heart and and with love and whatever. Right, I mean, right, I, I, right, I, right, I, right, I've, right. I've I've sat right. Zogchen retreats with with I sat a Zogchen retreat with Sokni Rinpoche, who's the guy who gave the quote I just gave before, who's the son of. Sam Harris's, you know, favorite teacher, Tulku Urgyen, and, you know, who whose style mm. of teaching Sam Harris wholly endorses. And the whole first mm -hmm. six days of the retreat or whatever, he's he's teaching what he calls essence love, right? Which is uh, prior to giving you the point out instruction, pointing out instructions, he's trying to get you in touch with a sort of softness of heart and, and love. Mm. Uh, and and uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, even in the traditional sort of super Buddhist-y Dzogchen presentation, <laughs> right, right. Uh, you're getting lots of that. Right. Okay. So, so let me be more precise here because I think, I think that's right. I don't – yeah, I would agree with what you said there that what Sam Harris is endorsing there, that end state of Rigpa might be exactly the same type of state as emotional fluidity. Um, what I think differs then, I guess, is – um, skillful, you know this term skillful means i've yeah vaguely yeah okay so it's a, it's a very common term in buddhism it goes with this idea that that uh you know you take up all these different views instrumentally as skillful means and they're all relatively skillful means right so so again obviously when you're talking about the nature of mind you've got to be talking in like kind of non-relative terms that doesn't mean that many many different types of form or practices mm -hmm. Or ways, uh, you know, means of approach aren't skillful means. Like they're they're helpful. <laughs> they're they're the, in in a relative sense. You know, in, like depending on where you are, it might mm -hmm. it might be way more helpful to get some instructions about you know doing internal thing. Like this is true for me right now in my practice. Right, like like mm -hmm. I'm getting a lot of alpha out of uh, doing a bunch of IFS, which makes it way easier to concentrate, which makes it way easier to do other kinds of meditation practice than I would by just drilling. Just recognize the nature of mind. You know what I mean? Like, like, um, yeah, uh, yeah. I that, guess, which, I guess which isn't to say that if you, if you, like, but Sam is talking from the standpoint of if you can instantly recognize the nature of mind, all the, yeah. there, there, that should be, it shouldn't uh, be a problem anymore. Well, uh, it, it won't be a problem in the sense that you won't be suffering in that instant, but also, uh, that is a position, a stance from which emotions can arise any emotion can arise utterly embraced you know i have to use myself as anecdotal evidence a lot because that's basically the only experience i have to go by right mm -hmm. so <laughs> i usually explain it like i'm not trying to become a better person anymore and yet i'm in 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 uh normal terms i am becoming better in the sense of Compassion is so much easier. I have so much more love open uh, uh, to my wife and my nearest and dearest. And I don't get triggered by other people. I can have much more empathy for people I don't know. Like everything seems to go naturally in that direction as mm -hmm. I do the somatic practices. And it seems like, yeah, it takes less and less effort for me to not cling or not suffer. And I, I don't know. Maybe I, I would assume because I like things like jhana meditation I've tried and had um, without any concentration practice basically been able to to get pretty far on those things that usually take, take a lot of practice as far as I understand. And I know Nick Camarada said something similar like he had only done these psycho, psychotechnology things for several years and then he could just jhana the first time he tried it or whatever. Mm. Um so I guess my question is, um, do you think rig – because there's one question about whether it's just easier to go down this route, like you said, and it takes you the same to, the same way. Maybe it would be easier for me now to go and do Dzogchen meditation um, because I don't have all that baggage to begin with. Mm. Uh, but so do you think that 
Rigpa is inherently joyful and and loving, um, um, which is how I would exp- explain my own state more and more. Even though I'm I'm okay with sorrow and fear and those emotions, they are not suffering anymore. Uh, there is still a natural inclination towards the quote unquote positive emotions. That seems to be the natural state of of us as humans when we're not actually scared and have a lot of unprocessed trauma or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a very tricky question. Uh, yes, and it's, I think I think the answer is uh, uh, what I'm about to say is much more tentative than than everything else I've said in this conversation. So so just bear, bear that in mind. But sure, we um, like that. Yeah, I, I have a, I have asked I've asked a similar question to to Michael Tapp, who's my meditation teacher too. Um, so, um, mm. put put differently, like like like, uh, does yeah, does the nature of mind intrinsically have these positive qualities of love and bliss and whatever else, right? Like like um, love especially, like is it sort of intrinsically compassionate as as is sometimes claimed, and how does that not run into t- a kind of tension with the the claim that it's coincident with every other kind of experience including hate and whatever else you know what i mean um Mm -hmm. and uh this is one of those things that i think is like paradoxical philosophically and not experientially but uh i would i would claim that if you are in the view of zogchen which is has both a sort of conceptual component and this perceptual you know rigpa like experiential thing uh that yeah this idea that like compassion would be the spontaneous response to suffering and that like you would find yourself feeling more and more loving toward other other people and all this stuff mm. and acting more lo- more and more mm. like i i would say that that would be true especially if you don't have some philosophical barrier that says you know i'm supposed to be disengaged from the world or something like that right i, th- mm-hmm. I think that would definitely be true um mm. uh in a relative sense when you're talking about practice uh i don't think it's helpful to say unless like if I was like you know Chris recognize the nature of mind right now, mm-hmm. and you like and you like searched your experience <laughs> and didn't find any like you know lovey dovey feelings, right? And then you said okay, therefore I can't recognize the nature of mind. I think that that would be bad and 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 not true. Yes, right. So so yes. so it can't true. be again for it to be the nature of mind. It can't be dependent upon particular form being there right now, including form associated with love. There's a sense in which like the quote unquote ultimate kind of love that is associated with the nature of mind i think is not it doesn't depend on the emotion of love no like the, i was just this, gonna say yeah you, yeah you, if right you're now. not resisting if you're not resisting fear in the least there is a, a type of embrace there yeah uh, that can be loving which out without the stereotypical quality yeah. of mdma love i guess yeah yeah so the, uh, i mean mdma love uh, at least some of mdma love has this nature of mind type quality too where like it's it can Mm -hmm. seem on mdma like what's happening is not some new love showing up but rather that you're just not self-conscious in the way that you tend to be and then that just yes is loving you know and yeah yes um yes yeah so i yeah i I, in that sense and again like i said you know sokni rinpoche whose zokchen teachings we've been reading in this conversation teaches essence love as like the first part of his zokchen presentation yeah yeah, i love that i love that no, that's that's great. I, I really appreciate your nuance on these things. And I mean, I'm noticing now in a kind of funny, silly way how it's so easy to I mean, there's there's something sweet and nice behind somebody experiencing something that's so useful for them and uh creates such a reduction in suffering that they just want everyone to experience the same. Um but there's also a trap in thinking that yeah, I don't think there's one one better way for everyone or one true way to do it or I mean we're all just talking about living more fulfilling and connected and loving lives in general free from suffering and I mean um whatever works for you or whatever floats your boat but I do think these discussions are very interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. And, well, and, and, like you can fall into like as, as you said like like all these uh it's very common to notice that one has been suppressing something that didn't one didn't know one was suppressing and then and then to blame you know either appropriately or inappropriately often appropriately the philosophical mm-hmm. view one was holding at least 
the way one was holding it for having fallen into that, you know? So it's like, like whether or not, you know, uh, say for example, Sam Harris actually says, you know, you don't need to deal with your emotions. Just fucking recognize the least of the self. <laughs> like, and you'll be good. Uh, it is very yeah. easy to notice that one's interpretation of what he has said has led one into a condition of like doing that to one's emotions. Like thinking like, like, yeah, like, like, yes, yeah, suppressing in some way, some subtle fixation. And that's true. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, all the way through the sort of meditative path, you notice you were fixating in ways that you didn't notice you were fixating before, you know, or the mm-hmm. thing you thought was Rigpa was ac- actually had a subtle fixation associated with it. That, that just keeps happening over and over. So, so without going into uh, uh, too long of a discussion on this, what do you think about the statement that, uh, that Joel Hudson made about, um, presumably speaking about fixating emptiness then, but his question was like, okay, where's the joy? Um, right as like a signpost to whether you are going in the right direction or not where's the joy where's the the love Uh, i definitely i definitely endorse find uh using joy and love as signposts on one's spiritual path yeah if you if you you are not eventually ending up with more joy and love uh i think think yeah what's the point something something's up there yeah exactly however (laughs) again like the reason why it's not emphasized in some Dzogchen teachings is because mm. if you if you if you did emphasize the joy and love component of it, and then you find yourself suffering, it would be very yes. like like a ton yes. and in a shitty state of mind. It would very very then, easy to then convince it's the, yourself. The opposite way clearly, around, right? Yeah, clearly it's not like clearly like the nature of mind is not available to me, right? Which yes. is not true. Yeah. Oh right. But then the question is how hard it is to actually practice in that way. Maybe it's more useful, actually, if I can go against my my original intuition a bit. Maybe mm. being so deeply in uh, despair, there could be some use in actually glimpsing, glimpsing complete freedom immediately and oh, build exactly. up exactly. to processing. So, so I actually, that's, that's very, yeah, that's an insight right now live. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Cool, yeah. But um yeah man this was uh, this was a long one. It was almost Joe Rogan territory, but I had a blast, man. As usual. Me too. Me too. Uh it, yeah, and, uh, uh, w- 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 just just so we didn't get to it, uh we did we did a little bit in terms of the conceptual, but uh mm-hmm. maybe maybe it's not it's not necessarily worth hashing out uh okay to uh, I I've just given this sort of defense of 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 the Zochen view, you know, to what extent mm-hmm. can Sam Harris be accused of not having given an adequate defense of it? Um right, uh, right. I do think in the in the end and I I say this is probably the greatest like Sam Harris completist that I know in the sense of, uh Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you you said you consumed all of his content. I think I literally have consumed all of his content. like no. um yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. uh in the end I don't think there's anything that I just said uh, about, you know, skillful means and emotional fluidity and all the rest that he would not endorse um so okay, that's cool. put put that way um and, and uh right right yeah i yeah. i would love to speak to him about this and, and many other things and um i hope to do so one day and um yeah man on the uh on the uh train of love and joy i have tremendous gratitude and love for you and I'm very, very happy that I get to talk to you and have you as a friend. Likewise, brother. Man, it's an absolute pleasure. That's awesome, man. All right. Have a great day. I'm going to go to bed. Bye.